Okay, our next talk is going to be by Hanno Böck uh, in search of evidence-based IT security, and he wants to do most of the introduction himself, so this is a very short and brief moment for me up on stage. Enjoy and give it up for Hanno. Hello. Yeah, hello. So, as I said, I'm Hanno Böck. I'm working as a journalist and a hacker, I like to say. I like to avoid the term security researcher, and I hope during my talk it will become obvious why that's the case. Um, I write articles mostly for Golem, uh, usually about IT security topics, and I run the fuzzing project where I try to improve the security of free and open source software, and this is funded by the Linux Foundation's Core Infrastructure Initiative, and I also write a monthly newsletter about TLS. So, um, as I work in IT security, I occasionally go to security conferences, and not just conferences like this one, but also conferences where you have a vendor area, where people are trying to sell IT security products. Um, so I have a few pictures here. Here someone is selling next generation APT defense. <laughs> Here's um, someone is selling something with artificial intelligence. Um, or someone is asking, everything is moving to the cloud, why isn't your security? <laughs> um. <laughs> and this vendor is saying the only vendor with guaranteed protection from ransomware. Um, and when I see these things, I, I, I'm a bit skeptical. Um, I'm not sure, I, I, I feel many of the terms don't have a real meaning, they feel like marketing terms, I don't really know what they are doing, or if, if I know what they are doing, it doesn't feel right. Um, and I'm not the only person skeptical about IT security products. So I don't know if you know this guy, this Tavis or Mandy, he's working for Google, and lately he's been looking at security products. And what he found was that many security products are not very secure. So, for example, he found out that Avast was using some open source code and they replaced strun copy with strun copy and introduced a buffer overflow. But it's faster, so great. Um, Trend Micro accidentally left a remote debugging server running. Um, or Palo Alto Network had a memory corruption because they shipped a web server that was no longer supported. Um, and here he was trying to contact AVG and said, uh, also, your code makes zero sense. Um, yeah. And we have headlines like this where uh, PC World says antivirus software could make your company more vulnerable. And on the upper right, antivirus tools are a useless box ticking exercise, says Google Security Trap. And uh, here are two tweets where there was recently a quite heated debate about the value of antivirus software where uh, Justin Shu, he's a Chrome developer, he compared antivirus to homeopathy. And um, April King, who is from Firefox, said antivirus cause pile of security issues for Firefox. Um, and this is from a, a, where Google asked um, users and IT security experts what they think is, are the most important things to do about IT security. And you can see the users had antivirus software as the very first thing. Uh, and the security experts don't seem to think that's so important. It doesn't even show up in the top five. So. Uh, we can conclude that there's a considerable disagreement whether IT security products and especially antivirus software is actually a good idea. Um, so, how do we know actually if these things work? And to investigate that, I'd like to uh, talk about something completely different. So, this industry likes to use medical analogies. We're talking about viruses. Viruses are usually something from medicine which affects people. And here's another form of antivirus. It's a vitamin C pill. And here's a person having a common cold, a sneezing. And yeah, many people think it's a good idea if you have a common cold that you should take vitamin C pills. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not very useful. 
Um, and why do we actually know that? Um, obviously, we know this because we have science. We're using science to investigate whether things work. And for the vitamin C, here are some quotes from a study which says, okay, regular ingestion of vitamin C ha had no effect on common cold incidents in the ordinary population. So if you're like an average adult person and take regular vitamin C, you're just as likely to get a cold than everybody else. Uh, however, it may be that it shortens the duration of your cold a little bit. But if you take the vitamin C only once you already got a cold, then it has no use at all. Um, and the study here is uh, from the Cochrane Collaboration, which is an organization that's doing uh, so-called meta-analysis, and I will come back later what that is, but it's generally an organization. Uh, I think there's widespread agreement that the Cochrane Collaboration is creating some of the highest quality scientific evidence in medicine. Um, so if we want to know if uh, medicine or also like something like a food supplement, like a vitamin C pill works, what's usually done is a so-called randomized controlled trial. And that is we just take a group of people that may have some, some illness and then we split them randomly into groups. And it's, uh, it's crucial that this is done randomly because we don't want to have some statistical thing that we chose one group uh, that is maybe more sick than the other group to begin with, and then this uh, screws with our results. So we need to split them randomly into groups, and a simple way would be, okay, one group gets a medication, the other group gets a placebo, and then we see what happens. Uh, in reality, it's usually more complicated because usually we have a situation where we already have a known good medication, and we have a new medication, and we just want to know if the new medication is better. So we compare an old and a new medication, and we also may have a, an alternative to medication like exercise or dietary changes, and we may want to know, okay, maybe we have a medication that works, but doing exercise works even better, and maybe taking both the medication and exercise at the same time works even more better. Um, but this is the general idea, so we randomly split people into groups and test what happens. But then, we usually don't really care about a single study because there are far too many things that can go wrong. So what we usually care about is all the scientific evidence we have as a whole. And that's why we're doing a meta-analysis, which is we're trying to search for all the studies that have been done on a particular topic, ideally randomized controlled trials, and we combine the results. This is obviously sometimes complicated because we might have studies with different groups of the population, uh, they cannot always be easily compared, but that's the ideal idea. So we have many studies and then we combine the result and look at the whole body of evidence. Um, yeah, so we call that evidence-based medicine. So ideally, uh, we want to make all decisions based on high quality scientific evidence, which uh, very often a, a meta-analysis qualifies. Um, now, I want to point out that um, one shouldn't have a too idealized view on science because there are many problems. Um, here, the top one is actually the most popular open access paper of all times, which says why most published research findings are false. It has been published in 2005, and that's actually not very controversial. So. Um, and the middle one points to an issue that has been debated in recent years a lot, where uh, there was a big experiment to try to replicate studies in psychology. And they found out that they, could, they were only able to uh, replicate the result of 37% of the studies. So the majority of studies, it seems, either they are wrong or the replication was wrong, but it seems there's a problem. Um, but this is not only affecting psychology, the, you have the same problem in many fields of sciences. For example, there's a very similar debate in cancer research. Um, and the lowest one points to something that uh, many clinical trials findings never get published, which is also a very important thing to consider, that the science we're seeing is not all the science that has happened. We very often have a situation where people do a study, and then 
based on the result, they decide whether it's interesting and gets published or whether it just gets thrown away. So this, uh, yeah. So if you want to evaluate what's good or bad science, then there are some things we can look at. Uh, something very obvious is if we have a very small number of research subjects. So sometimes you see studies where people say, okay, we've tested this with 10 people. Then I say, yeah, okay, that's maybe not very meaningful. It could be just coincidence, could be a statistical glitch. Um, then, which is a very common thing, not only with the quality of the science itself, but also with the reporting about science, like when the media reports about it, is that uh, correlations are reported as if they were causal results. So what's happening here is if we have a set of data and we may find out all the people who have property A also have property B, then we could conclude, okay, A causes B. But it could also be that B causes A. Or it could also be that there's a so-called confounder, which means we have something completely different that we may not even know about that's causing both A and B. So, uh, and this is generally a problem in all studies where you're using an existing data set and trying to find something in it. And that's why we are doing these controlled trials where we are splitting groups randomly into two groups so we can exclude that there's some, some other factor that's uh, happening here. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes we only have a single study or very few studies. So uh, we usually want good science to be based on many studies. We want science to be replicated independently. Um, and then we have a thing that's called publication bias. And that's what I mentioned earlier with we don't see all the studies that are done. Uh, and we may have a situation where a pharmaceutical company makes a trial on a medication and it turns out the medication doesn't really help, and then they don't publish the trial. And then they do another trial, and there it seems like the medication helps, and then they publish it. Um, and you can see that like, if you only see the positive studies, and you don't see the negative studies, then, and then you try to combine these results like in a meta-analysis, then you get a skewed result. And another problem is uh, called outcome switching, and it's kind of related to fishing for results, which is you may have collected some data, and but it doesn't match your theory. But then you could try, okay, maybe um, if I just uh, use a subselection of my data, I might f may, maybe I can prove something similar to my theory. And if you look long enough, you can take some random data and you will find something that looks like a scientific result. Um, so, um, it's not generally a problem to do this, but you should be transparent about it. If you were first se searching for something and then later you're searching for something else, you should at least make clear that you did that. And ideally, you would want all, uh, all these studies that are somehow based on statistics, that are empirical studies, you want them to be pre-registered, which would mean that you would publish before you even start collecting the data what you're about to do. So you could say, yeah, I want to study this medication. I'll do a randomized controlled trial with these groups. Um, and then I publish that in a trials register. Because then if you later change what you were studying, then other people can see that. So uh, it's transparent. But we're very far from that. In medicine, this is happening usually. It's still not ideal. There are still a lot of problems with this. But in many other fields, this is uh, not happening at all. OK, now let's get back to IT security. Um, here's an empty slide. And it's not a mistake. It's intentionally empty, because it's also the complete list of all randomized control trials that have ever been done on security software. <laughs> um, Um, there are some people who are doing something that may look a bit like scientific tests of antivirus software, um, but I, I feel the methodology that's used there is extremely flawed. Um, so what they usually do is they, they have a collection of malware, uh, which is hopefully somewhat representative of real malware, and then they try which software detects it and which not. Um, this has a lot of problems because, for example, if you detect a malware, 
that does not mean if you wouldn't detect the malware that it would infect the user. It could be that the malware tried to use a browser exploit and the exploit is only in an old version of the browser that the user is no longer using. And um, they usually completely fail to, to consider the idea that you could do something else than antivirus software to protect yourself. Like the, you could use regular updates and application whitelisting. Um, so these tests kind of have the idea that antivirus is the only thing you can do and the only thing that matters is comparing different products against each other. Um, they usually don't consider that antivirus software itself could be a security risk, but most important of all, the, they usually don't test with real users. They are testing in some kind of lab condition where they say they are simulating what a real user is doing, but they are not testing with real users. Um, and it's, it's quite widespread that you see uh, questionable forms of statistics in IT security. Uh, one very notorious example is also CVE counting, when people say, so CVEs are, uh, I don't know if everyone knows that, these are identifiers for security vulnerabilities. And what some people tend to do is say, okay, Windows had that many CVEs, Linux had that many CVEs, so clearly Windows is more secure than Linux. Uh, this is completely flawed because these CVE identifiers uh, don't even try to be complete. And um, if you don't believe me, there's a talk from the guy who invented these CVE IDs where he thinks you shouldn't do these kinds of statistics. Um, so, um, my feeling is that IT security is largely not based on scientific evidence. And this is a bit of something that bothers me because I work in IT security and I'm a very scientifically minded person. So when someone tells me, hey, this is healthy, then I say, hey, do you have some studies to show me? And if you don't have the studies, then I don't believe it. Uh, and at the same time, I'm working in a field where if I ask this question, the answer is just the evidence is not there very often. Um, and now um, you might say, okay, but aren't there plenty of scientific papers and conferences on IT security? And um, here's a list of some of the most cited papers. And a quick remark on that, like counting the citations of papers itself is a very controversial thing. Um, but I cannot go into that, but there's a whole debate about whether you should use something like an impact factor or whether that's a bad idea. Um, but at least I think it tells us which are the scientific papers that other scientists care about. Um, and this is a list from Google Scholar, from papers from 2012 and 2013. Um, so the first one here says, candidate indistinguishability, obfuscation, and functional encryption for all circuits. Um, now, I, I could ask, if we have a, a average user who is using the internet, writing emails, using a web browser, using Facebook, whatever. Um, how does that matter for him? If you have an answer for that, I would really like to hear it. Talk to me later. Um, and, and I think you could ask similar questions for all of these papers. Um, I had to go till number 11, where I found something that sounded like it was actually about real software. That was a paper about Android malware. And also at number 20, I found another paper that was about real software, which was the Lucky 13 paper. And that one uh, made me kind of question myself, because this is the kind of paper that I usually care about, because I do a lot of crypto stuff, and this is a crypto attack. Um, it's a timing attack, and it's really hard to pull that attack off. Um, and it's so hard that I'm almost certain that this attack has never been used in the wild to attack a real user. But these are the kinds of papers we find interesting because we say, oh, they were able to pull off this interesting attack. That's great. That questions all the way how we did encryption. Um, and it had a pretty big impact. Um, yeah, I'm also proud that I found a little mistake in that paper, actually. Uh, it's not very important, but so, yeah. So when I, um, yeah, but in this whole list with 26 papers that were the most cited papers, there was not a single paper that was doing anything with real users, where they were trying to see what's happening when real users act with the internet, do something about security. So it seems the user is not really something IT security research cares a lot about. Um, 
So my feeling is uh, most academic research in IT security is comparable to basic research. When we talk about, I don't know, homomorphic encryption or indistinguishability obfuscation, these are crypto theories that may lead to some interesting products far in the future. Um, and that's fine. I mean, basic research is totally fine. But I feel we're completely missing the applied research. And if we do, like, the more, if we look at the more practical research, I feel it tends to go into interesting sub problems, but not the most important problems. Which is also kind of fine, but I feel there's a, there's a whole big area we're missing here. So, uh, what would we do if we would say we want to do a randomized control trial on a security software? We could say, okay, get a large group of users and randomly split them in groups. We have some groups that use some different IT security products. We could say one group uses some alternative treatment, which could be something like applying regular updates and doing application whitelisting, which is generally considered the most viable alternative to antivirus software. Um, and we could say one group gets a training where we say, okay, don't click on these email attachments. Um, I have to say here, I don't think training users is a very, uh, very good strategy, but I think we should test that anyway. Uh, and then we could have a placebo group where we say, uh, just do the same thing you did before. Um, and then we try to measure security incidents, which may be tricky to even decide when a security incident happened. Um, then we could also try to measure what side effects does this have? Do things crash? Do things get slower? What does it cost? Do we have some downtimes? And um, then after some time, we compare the result. Now. Um, I have discussed this with a number of people before I did this talk, and the, the first reaction that usually comes is some form of, this is really hard, and there's this problem, and that problem, and that problem. And I totally agree. This is really hard. Science is hard. That's just how it is. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. So some problems that would show up, uh, for, you could ask what's about the ethics of such a trial, because you would say you give some security products to some people and not to others, so do you put them at risk? Um, but if you think about it, that's a very comparable situation to medicine. If you test a medical drug, then you give the drug to some people and you don't give it to other people. So it could be that this drug helps some people and doesn't help the others, but it could also be that this drug has a risk and uh, that people suffer from taking that drug. But we generally have the idea in medicine that if we don't know whether a drug helps, then testing it is an ethical thing because it will help many more people in the future. Um, yeah, then we may wonder how do we reliably measure what's an incident because we may have situations where um, it's not even clear uh, what was a hack or uh, you have been hacked and you don't know about it. And you probably get very different results whether you have uh, someone who is just affected by the normal everyday internet malware thing or someone who is uh, targeted, uh, someone who is targeted by, by a professional attacker. Uh, and many more. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy. Like, there are many problems to be solved. Um, and, uh, I think the, the security applications and antivirus software are just an example here. I think there are many things that we could test with such tests, like there are debates about the safety of programming languages. Is Rust better than C++? I think so, but I would like to see studies on it. Or application security, like is browser A uh, more secure than browser B? Could be tested. Um, And finally, I want to bring up an example, which I say is, is in some sense both a good and a bad example. So this was a tweet from the FTC, uh, the Federal Trade Commission in the US, um, where they say, encourage your loved ones to change passwords often and some other things. So, um, uh, um, 
Yeah, so uh, at some point they found out uh, they actually had no scientific evidence for this recommendation to change passwords often. And they tried to find out why are we recommending this and then they said, okay, we're recommending this because we're doing it ourselves, so it must be good. Um, um, and then they basically recommended the opposite. They said, okay, uh, we we have reconsidered this, we looked at the evidence, we have some studies that say so that mandatory password changes are not a, probably not a good idea and maybe you should not change your passwords on a regular basis. So um, I looked at the studies that they were citing for that and I was not completely convinced. So I felt the quality of these studies was not very high. So all of them were based on on observational data. That means they didn't make any intervention where they put people in groups, but they they did things like they had password data from a company where at some point they had a password changing policy and at other points not. And um, th then there was one where, which was trying to make a theoretical model of password breaks and password changes and how much that matters. Um, but the, the basis of all of these studies was observational data. And then also some of these studies try to measure things like password quality by their entropy. And if you think about that, that's not really what we care about. What we care about is whether our data gets hacked. Uh, we don't care about the entropy of our passwords. Maybe the entropy of our passwords is an indicator that our, we have a good password, but it's only one factor. And there are other things like if you re reuse a password, that's also bad. So maybe people use a strong password, but use it for many different services, and that's also bad. And uh, in medicine, there's a term for that, and that's a surrogate endpoint, which is when you're measuring something that's not the thing you really care about, but maybe an indicator of what you care about. And that's generally considered a lower quality of evidence. Um, so the good thing here is the FTC found out that they didn't have scientific evidence for their recommendations and they said, okay, we have to look at the scientific evidence. But the not so good thing is I think the quality of the evidence was not so good. So the real conclusion would be maybe we just don't know and we should do some proper studies on that. Um, so finally, I have some uh, things where I think like, I think this is the right approach, but I think it has some limits that should be considered. Um, there are things that where we want to protect ourselves against uh, threats that we cannot really measure because they may be just future threats. For example, currently we have a debate about post-quantum cryptography. Do we need to protect ourselves in this, uh, against quantum computers? There are no quantum computers today, so we cannot measure any attacks with quantum computers, but we still may want to prepare for that. And there are things where we have attack scenarios that are very obscure, where we say, okay, what if a nation state is uh, compromising a Debian developer and he gives me a different package than the one he, he's telling me, which is something that the reproducible builds community is trying to tackle, um, uh, which is, uh, it, I'm not sure if such an attack ever happened, but it may still be something you want to think about against protecting. So that's, there, there are definitely situations where you cannot do this approach with a controlled study. Um, and one more thing, there are sometimes claims that are simply against, that violate basic scientific principles. For example, if a vendor promises full protection from malware, that's just a lie. It's simply a lie because that's, that's impossible uh, because of the so-called halting problem, which is a very basic theorem of computer science. And there's a related debate in medicine where some people argue we shouldn't even study something like homeopathy because it simply cannot be true based on the laws of physics. So, yeah, that was my last slide. Um, so I think today IT security is often, very often not based on scientific evidence. Uh, we rely on experience, we rely on experts, or even worse, we may rely on marketing. We should have evidence-based IT security, but right now we don't have the science to do that. Yeah, thank you. I said we likely don't have time for question, but if someone is very quick and runs up to the microphone, then we can take one. Yes, microphone three. Um, if you, 
Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, if you go to, to medical studies, it's actually the highest quality that you do double-blinded randomized controlled studies, which means neither the experimenter nor the participant yeah. knows whether it takes placebo or the actual medication. You think that is something that you can actually implement because people act differently if they know they have the placebo or if they yeah. have the drug, which um, greatly the, interferes the randomized control. Um, the, control that's studies. a valid point. So, so blinding studies, if you can do that, depends on your situation. Because there are situations where you cannot blind if it's something that the user has to actively do. But if possible, yeah, blinding is better. Okay, sorry. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions. But uh, as I said, Hannah will be uh, prepared and ready to ask some questions right here. Thanks.